You're in the cemetery or seminary? Seminary. Oh, good, yeah, good, yeah, good. Listen, I, hey. I, was, I didn't know exactly what he said. I was like, did he say cemetery? I, the, well, seminary. This right, is wonderful. So, okay, so good, good, good. I'm Swedish and from Louisiana. Yeah. Speaking is hard for me. <laughs> As long as you get y'all right. Yeah, as long as I get y'all right. Yeah, and, and, and now pecan, too. Um, pecan. I heard back there. Yeah. If you're selling it, pecan. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. Now, I, I don't want to go too far down into dark psychic forces and magic crystals, but um, Marion Williamson, the other night on the debate stage, mentioned Denmark, South Carolina. Yes. And the situation there. And I, I think many Americans rushed to Google to see if there actually was a Denmark, South Carolina. Yeah, there is. And, and I've actually paid attention to this story over time about the situation there and it, it just always fascinates me how the media has it's like when the weather comes through new york city you get 24 7 meteorology forecasts on cnn but otherwise you never hear about the weather anywhere and the same with flint michigan um but i wanted to ask you about th that in south carolina because i love the state of south carolina and, and much like georgia and, and the south you go through areas of deep deep poverty that are immediately next areas of great wealth yes and it, it it blurs the lines there. So if, if you wouldn't mind talking about that a little bit. Well, you know, no doubt about the, uh, the, the quality of water and other issues that you find in rural parts of South Carolina, rural parts of the country, and frankly, in places like Flint, Finch, Michigan, are things that we should all be willing to uh, aggressively address and attack in ways that, that will reduce the challenges in those areas. The fastest way to do that is to bring economic opportunity to places where we have not seen it growing before. And when you do that, you start alleviating the challenges, long-term and structural challenges that have been persistent for generations. Most of the things that we see today that we're yelling about weren't created yesterday. They take generations of decay to get to places where you have to have an emergency. Uh, good news is there's a way to solve that on the front end. And typically, free markets, capitalism, focus on the the main thing being the main thing, which is alleviating human suffering through free markets is a really important way to get there. Related to that, let me get his name right. Um, I know he's from Greenwood because I got family in Greenwood. Um, Charles, who is here from Greenwood, wanted to know uh, on the issue of e economics versus morality, the, the problems facing this country right now, he was interested in how you see this, and, and one of the particular things that, that he asked about is I know something that you wanted to talk about, and that is the, the tenor of conversa political conversations we're having in this country right now. And his concern is how do you talk about the moral problems in the country tied to the economic problems in the country when everybody's yelling at each other? Well, it's hard to be heard when everyone's yelling at each other. Perhaps it's a challenge. We need to have a return of civility in the public forum if we're to be successful as a nation. The challenge of a lack of civility in the public forum is that the strongest, best ideas are never heard. Because when you have so much discourse that is unfriendly or uncivil, what ultimately happens is that your ideas get smaller because they're relegated to corners. When th that leads to a domino effect, which at the end of the dominoes is a society that is now debating whether it's socialism or capitalism, whether free markets are truly, is truly the best way to free people from the oppression of poverty and lack, or is it in fact a system of perfectly redistributing wealth equally around the world and around our nation? If you believe in that system, you also believe that you can perfect mankind. And I don't believe in the perfection of mankind unless it's Jesus Christ. So outside of that, you find yourself You find yourself supporting a system that has lost and, def and failed and really led to the demise of 100 million people around the world. Or you have to focus on the tenets and the principles that without question works wherever it is applied. And what we've seen from a moral perspective on, on finance is an uneven application of free markets because they work. I'm a guy that was born in poverty. I was raised in a single parent household, disillusioned about what was possible, and my life reflected that disillusionment. I had two major blessings. One was a small business owner, a Chick-fil-A operator. Thank God for Chick-fil-A. Amen. Stay through, right? <laughs> Who taught me that everything, all things were possible for anyone from anywhere at any time if you apply yourself. I didn't believe that as a freshman in high school. I, I'm one of the few senators that 
have flunked out of high school. I failed world geography and civics. <laughs> now, I will tell you that Are after, you on the Foreign Affairs Committee? <laughs> I'm not on the Foreign Affairs <laughs> After seven years in the United States Senate, I am not the only one failing civics <laughs> in America. <laughs> not any question. So no question about that. Uh, and so you, you have to have someone who understands and appreciates the potential of this nation, and then you have to create a system that allows for human flourishing and the individual to succeed in that system is what I think our responsibility is to defend, which is a free market system, a dem democratic form of, of capitalism. So I would say to, the, to Charles in, in Greenwood, South Carolina, that if you're concerned uh, about morality and, and, and economics, and you think that the roads don't intersect, they, they always do. Uh, and the only question we should ask ourselves is what is the fairest system of encouraging and in producing higher levels of economic prosperity at the same time making sure that that system is anchored in, in absolute truth that creates an objective standard that allows for the rule of law to flourish. Without those three principal layers, nothing succeeds except chaos. And so if you want to have the, the, the best society, the most moral society, you have to have a society that has a single definition of absolute truth and on that definition of absolute truth, you must then build an objective standard, and then you can have the rule of law, and then we all have a chance to flourish. Without that, the system fails. Now, I tell people all the time I'm a conservative because I think we're all sinners, and I want as few in charge of me as possible. <laughs> Amen to that. Yep. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, and along those lines, getting you know, to your point, we, we seem to have, and, and I know Josh Hawley has talked about this in the Senate, that we've, we've got this robust free market system in the country, but we also have a system where a lot of the people who are running the free market system don't seem to share the values that, that foster the free market. And we see this increasing relationship between the government and certain enterprises where it's, we've almost got a, a system of government that protects certain businesses that give enough money. How, how do we get through the cycle so that the little guy can become the big guy without the big guy passing regulations to stop the little guy from picking them off? Well, one of the things that we should celebrate under President Trump's uh, leadership is the responsible reset of a regulatory environment that allows for competition to actually flourish. Amen to when that. you have a high level of regulatory, when you have a high level of regulations, it only benefits the monopolies or duopolies or the largest companies in the country. So when you reset the regulatory environment, you actually encourage competition. One of the reasons why we've seen wage growth uh, in a way that we haven't seen in more than a decade is not simply because of the tax restructuring, it's because of the responsible reset of regulations that allows for us to find a competitive market here in our country. That has not been the case for the last decade. I want to shift gears a little bit. And I've asked you this question in the past, but it's been a while since I've been able to talk to you about this in front of people. How did you get into politics? You know, I'll tell you, two, two, those two blessings that I talked about earlier, that, that uh, entrepreneur, John Moniz, who really believed that there was something in me that I could not see in myself, and he helped to excavate that. And a mother who believed that prayer is the key and faith unlocks the door. And so she was always the encourager in my life. Uh, she would always tell me that God had a plan for my life. It's more like the Romans 8.28 um, approach to living. And that if I would stay with it, that things would turn out really well. And then the c combination of the two really said... She said to me one day, son, you have the gift for gab. In other words, you talk too much. <laughs> uh, you need to do something productive with it. And I had an eighth grade teacher who said, you know, one of the things you can do to be productive with your desire to talk during my class is to get involved in student council. And, and that really set me on the path towards public service. And my mentor, when I was a sophomore or junior, told me that it is better to give than receive. That's Luke's 38. And what he was trying to tell me was that instead of asking people for what you need, give people what you have, and the more you give, you will create a return. The law of the harvest will come your way. And frankly, it's, it's just been so astonishing how well that system works. And it's undeniable that sometimes you have crop failure, but over time, you will always receive more than you give. So if we focus on what we have to give to our nation, what we have to give to our community, what we have to give to our faith, 
you create the, the, the law of reciprocity, but you don't just give back what you give, you get it back in a harvest. So you get waves of the same thing coming in, and the economic principle that we have as a nation has proven that. The moral principles that have un undergirded our society has proven that as well. There's a reason why since 1970 we have reduced severe poverty in the world through our free market system. There's a reason why we stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves around the world. Uh, we do that with great passion, but we do that with conviction because it's a part of who we are as an American people. It's part of why we are exceptional, and it is the answer to Alexis de, 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 excuse me, de Tocqueville's uh, visit and journey through America when he said, America is great because America is good, and he found our goodness in places of worship. And he realized that what actually is the greatest springboard for our nation is that we focus not on ourselves, but on others. It's a fulfillment of what I believe is a Judeo-Christian foundation in this nation. That was a really good answer. <laughs> I hesitated to, to ask you these questions because I, I, I really feel like, and I could be wrong, but I really feel like you're the guy who Republicans and reporters turn to to talk about um, diversity in the Senate and civility in, in politics. And I didn't want to get you tired of these questions, but so I reached out to your staff. They said, no, uh, this would be something to talk about. I remember distinctly, I cannot remember the name of the reporter, and I don't really want to shame him, but a couple of years ago, they were referring to one of your Democratic colleagues as the only African-American member of the Senate, and you were in the Senate at the time. And it just, it, it's striking to me how often we, we do have growing diversity within the Republican Party, but there really is still this divide where Republicans seem to take this we need diversity of idea, and Democrats seem to take this, we need diversity of ethnicity and, and race. And where do you see this conversation shaping up within the Republican Party? Yeah, so I take this uh, very seriously. And I was having a conversation with my good friend, James Langford, and he, uh, I was like, wow, I, didn't, I, never, I never realized this, to be honest with you, Eric. Uh, Langford tells me that the greatest minority in the U.S. Senate. Gingers. They're redheads. Yep. Yep. There's only one redhead mm -hmm. in the entire United States Senate. James Langford from yep. Oklahoma. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's what you were talking about, but I assume not. Um, so, you know, I think we need to have diverse faces and voices sharing a center right conservative message about why America is the greatest nation on earth. I think we win as we diversify the voices as long as we have a core conviction of what it is that we believe. It is not an absolutely essential thing, but it certainly is necessary if we want to be competitive with the forces that have diverse voices, diverse faces. But if your goal is to have an identity conversation, I'm not your guy. If your objective is to make sure that every zip code in this nation has a chance to, to succeed, and by having success come from every corridor of this nation, you will simply diversify the voices and the faces who speak and teach and share the gospel of free markets and conservatism. I'm involved in that. Yeah. I, I have been writing now for the last six or seven months that it, the time seems ripe to have this conversation. When you look at the party opposite, it is increasingly a party run by secular, wealthy, white liberals who don't necessarily share the values of the minority communities who are within the Democratic coalition. Yes. Uh, and that there's a time now for Republicans to speak up on these cultural issues where they have much more common ground with black and Hispanic voters in the Democratic Party than yes. the leaders of the Democratic Party do. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the, 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 I have... Uh, had an interview, I think, on Monday or Tuesday on Fox News, and we were talking about the challenges of some of the president's tweets and, and Baltimore specifically. And I don't think we should spend any time denigrating anyone's character, number one. But number two, what I would love for us to do is have a serious debate about why it is that the major metropolitan areas in this country that have been run by liberal politicians for generations continue to produce a subpar uh, outcome for their very important residents. And so what I wanted to do was have a debate about the policy positions of this administration versus that of any administration. And what you'll find very quickly is that 
wages in the last two years are up over 3%, but more importantly, when you delve into the numbers, the bottom 20% of earners have seen the fastest wage growth in this nation. Uh, the uh, BEA, the Board of Economic Analysis, have just revised the numbers for 2016, 20, I mean, 2017 and 2018, where the wages are up 5%, 4.5 and 17, 5% and 18, said differently, that's $370 billion of additional money to spend for the average person. The first six months of this year is $378 billion additional dollars to spend because when the wage growth continues at the fastest clip we've seen in more than a decade, the benefit goes to the poorest people. When you create $6 million since the passage of the tax reform, 6 million jobs since the passage of the tax reform, 3 million of those new employees are African Americans and Hispanics. A million new African Americans working, 2 million more Hispanics working out of 6 million jobs. So this president has seen 50% of all the jobs created since our tax reform go to black, black folks and brown folks. If you think about the Opportunity Zone legislation that I worked on and, and, and led, sponsored in the Senate with the president's endorsement, we have almost $30 billion of private sector money, not government dollars. Government dollars, by the way, are your dollars. But <laughs> so private sector dollars coming back to the poorest, most distressed communities where the poverty rate is over 31%. We have done that as Republicans, you think about criminal justice reform. We, we watched the Democrat debates on whether Biden should take responsibility for incarcerating decades worth of Afri disproportionately African-American males. President Trump, through his criminal justice reform package, has reset the tables that the benefit goes to disproportionately African-American males. You think about the first HBCU, historically black colleges and universities, flying in all the presidents and chancellors to meet with their members of Congress, the first time it's ever been done, led by Congressman Mark Walker, a white guy, Republican, and myself. Uh, so we have an agenda that is inclusive by design and benefits minority communities, this is the time for us to have a debate about the ability to grow the pie as an American people where every single aspect of our society is included in benefiting from the growth of that pie. This is a time for us to take a look at a 70% income tax versus the new 37% income tax. Do you spend your money better than the federal government? The answer is yes. The 4% wealth tax, including unrealized gain. Let me say that differently. If you inherit assets from your father, mother, family members, the left wants to tax it whether it's cash or not. So if you get land, if you get a farm, if you get a house, the left says, we have to figure out a way to take the resources from that property, even though you haven't received a penny, and tax it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about things that are fundamentally antithetical to the American prosperity, the story of American prosperity, and we're debating these issues as if they're real. <laughs> wow! Right. <laughs> Well, and you look at the Democratic debates these past couple of weeks, and one of the big hot-button issues for the Democrats right now, uh, opposed by a majority of Americans, including a majority of, of African Americans, is the issue of reparations. And you know, at what, this plays into the conversation I actually really do want to talk to you and the other members of, of the Senate and, and House who are going to be here today on the debt and the deficit and paying for stuff. But in addition to the Democrats seem like they just want to pass out trillions of dollars to various groups, not really in order to accomplish anything other than to get votes. Well, there's a couple things I'd say on, on reparations and the, the Democrats' desire to pass out cash that we don't have. I mean, we're already spending $4 trillion as a nation. We are running a trillion dollar deficit, so that should be a sign that we don't necessarily have the cash to pay for what we're doing right now, much less extending benefits 
to make up for a past sin. I mean, there's no question that slavery is the original sin, but you can go back to President Lincoln's second inauguration as he thought through the price this nation is paying for that original sin. 4% of all the men in this nation lost their lives at the time because of the Civil War. Probably half or better on the northern side fighting and losing their lives to free slaves in the south. Uh, and so when you think about the equilibrium of the, yeah, the blood taken by the lash versus the blood taken by the sword, there was a retribution or a compensation that we haven't even factored into the conversation about reparations. So you can't get there without going there. However, there were 31 million folks living in this country in 1865 or so. We have about 330 million. They tell me that the price of a slave in, in the 1860s or in, in earlier was more than an annual salary of the average person living in the South, so much so that the average person in the South cannot afford a slave. And so who are you going to charge for the atrocity, atrocity of slavery and who gets to benefit from it? Because the good news is in our nation, this melting pot theory has actually worked. And so it's an it's a unfortunate way of trying to get people engaged in the conversation that really is to polarize this nation, creating the common denomination, common denominator of fear that always works. But it's a bad strategy for growing a country and I think it's a terrible strategy for winning the election. We should spend more time talking about ways for us to create an, an even playing field and if you're going to do that, it starts with the price of a bad education and the cost of a good education. If we spent more time making sure that our public schools created positive, awesome options in the poor zip codes, we would have a new conversation about American wealth and it would double the middle class within the African American and Hispanic communities. Wow. Thank you. Related into these is, uh, I know the, we got the budget deal, and a lot of conservatives have been upset with the deal and the spending and the growing deficit now, a trillion dollars, we're adding to a $22, $23 trillion national debt. Um, Republicans have long said that they're the party of fiscal responsibility, and yet there are a lot of signs that the party in charge of the White House and Congress has not lived up to the, the merit of the title. Uh, what do Republicans do about the debt and the deficit? Well, they're right. We haven't. That's a problem. If we are going to truly control our national debt of $23 trillion, you have to find A, a backbone, and B, deal with entitlement reform because the annual appropriations represents about 27% or 28% of all of our spending. 70% or more of our spending is on automatic increase. And we have lacked the will to deal with that issue. We must, if we want to talk about the national debt without talking about entitlement reform, you're not talking about the national debt, period. I, I don't know why it's so hard to, to conceive or consider what President Reagan did in 1982 or so when he said in 2009 your retirement age is going to be higher. If you give someone 27 years to figure it out, they figure it out. Right. If we can't say to someone who's under 55 years old today that you're going to have to wait six months longer or some new formula to get retirement benefits, if we want to honor our word to the greatest generation that saved the world, if we want to honor those folks, we have to say to the rest of us that we may have to delay benefits if you're 40 years old by a year, if you're 30 years old by two years, if you're in your teens, um, we're going to talk about a brand new system. I think the American people, everyday people working really hard, very long hours would say, Okay, 
if you give me time to plan and we're going to get closer to an actuarially sound retirement system called Social Security, I think we can engage them. If we're going to talk about the fact that our health care costs are growing faster than any other sector of, of government spending, I think they say, let's have a seat and let's talk about ways for us to improve our, our output. Uh, we, you know, we have to have serious conversations. And frankly, we have our, our, our national debt is so high that we have an artificially low interest rate which means we're paying about 350 to 370, under $400 billion on interest only on our debt. If we went through the 25 year average from an interest rate perspective, our debt payment with interest only would go to $800 billion. Said differently, that's nearly 30% of what we bring in. Oof. Well, it, it, you know, in that regard. That's I, the good news. Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> We won't even talk about retirement, the yeah. $100 trillion fiasco of, of defined benefits when we need to be moving to defined contribution. That's a whole different conversation. <laughs> I consider myself a recently well-educated person who pays attention to the news, and I was shocked to read the other day that uh, a frustration from a progressive about the Democratic debate that they spent so much time bashing American health care insurance companies, and they're only 5% of the health care costs in the country. I, I assumed it must be astronomically much more than that because that's where all the venting goes as insurance companies when there's so much more to deal with with health care. Well, listen, there's one thing about our friends on the left. They, they, gotta, they, they have to figure out who the boogeyman is <laughs> and they have to sell you the boogeyman. And if you open your closet door and you don't see a boogeyman, then he's under your bed. And if he's not under your bed, he's in your attic. There's got to be a boogeyman out there. And unfortunately, we will spend more time looking for the boogeyman than we will actually looking for the solutions for health care. And frankly, if you want solutions for health care, what you have to do is realize that Republicans and Democrats agree both on the pre-existing condition. But what we want on the right is more state flexibility. There's something called uh, 1332 waivers that allows for states to be more flexible in finding ways to provide solutions on the healthcare front. There's a way for us to drive down the cost of drugs as well. If you think about the fact that off patent, 90% of medicine, 94% of medicine that people use every day, they can get with their, with their prescription card for zero. There's been some real innovation. Now we have the next wave of drugs in our world will be uh, personalized genome medicine that allows for us to attack uh, cancers and other challenges in a very unique and specific way to the person, there's going to be a cost of that. But for the vast majority of folks who receive their medicine, they're receiving their medicine at a price point that is unbelievable because of the free market system. So we have to apply that system to those drugs and to those parts of the system that need some help. And there are some areas that need some help in the healthcare space, but innovation, creativity, flexibility, will allow for us to recreate the healthcare system in such a way, in my opinion, that we can lower costs, improve innovation, and long term um, deal with the challenges. But if you notice, I'm talking about the actual cost of healthcare and not who pays for it. The Democrats are talking about who pays for it without dealing with the underlying issue. And the underlying issue is if you don't reduce the cost of healthcare, you cannot reduce how much you pay, forgetting who pays? Senator Scott, I've got one more thing for you here. We had the governor of Georgia on stage. He made a pitch for Georgia. I know we've got some people from South Carolina here. We've got all people from 40 states here. I'll give you the last opportunity here to sell South Carolina. Thank you. I'm, a, I'm so sad that I only have 45 minutes for this part of the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me just say, I, I know that we are in the peach state. And, and this is a beautiful place. Uh, you do realize, Eric, you, you're, aren't you a Georgia resident? Yes. Okay. You do realize that we produce more peaches I, I in South that. Carolina yeah. than you do in Georgia. We apparently produce more blueberries now. <laughs> okay. Well, good for you. Anyways, uh, uh, the, the, the number one tourist destination in America by Condé Nast magazine released just a couple weeks ago is Charleston, South Carolina. I'll clap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, it is also like three out of the last five years, the number one tourist destination in all of the world. 
One of the top 10 islands is Kiowa Island. Oh, yes. Uh, three of the top 10 hotels in America just a few years ago was the Sanctuary, Kiowa, Planners Inn, downtown Charleston, and, and another hotel I can't remember the name of in Somerville, South Carolina. Greenville, South Carolina, if you want to go on walks on trails and see smaller mountains, not like Colorado, but they're still mountains, you can come to Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, if you want to go to the capital of commerce, uh, it is hard to deny BMW, Boeing, Volvo's new location, Mercedes-Benz in, in uh, Latson, South Carolina, the five major tire companies, one of the top 10 places to do business in the country, South Carolina. If you really want to talk about the little jewels, we're building an African-American museum in downtown Charleston because before, I think it was 1677, 70% of all slaves came through Charleston. So if you want to understand and appreciate the beauty of South Carolina's history, come to Charleston. If you also want to see Matthew 5:44, loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you, you cannot miss Mother Emanuel AME Church where a racist walked into the front door of a black church, killed nine people in 2015. The family members of those nine uh, folks who lost their lives stood up and said, we forgive you. And our entire nation stopped to see what in the world, in the place where the Civil War started, we are now having a new civil unity starting in the same place because God has a sense of equilibrium and he allowed for those family members to do something that was undeniably the most biblically sound doctrine and response to a tragedy. You need to come and check it out because it is a place where hope springs eternal. That was heck of a sales pitch. Senator Scott.